Sorry about the slight delay, but good evening and a warm welcome to the fourth week of Pillory term at the Oxford University Scientific Society. After a technical hiccup last week, we're back with even more interesting science for all of you. This week, I have the absolute honor to welcome Professor Andrew Lowe as our speaker tonight. Professor Lowe teaches at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and I came across his fascinating work through an online course. Not trying to spoil the contents of this talk, I can tell you that truly, it is a dream come true to be able to hear him live. I was told that finance experts with a strong interest in science is a rare find nowadays. I'm sure many of you will have questions during the talk. Please write them in the comments section and our committee members will collect them and feed it back to the studio in the Q&A session. Sit back and be amazed. Professor Lowe, we look forward to your talk. Excuse me, your audio is not working properly. Uh. I'm afraid we might have to do some testing. Um, have you turned on the microphone on the screen? No, we still can't hear you very well. Um, is it on? Is it on the um, the setup of the restream platform? No, nope, we still can't hear you very well. Okay. Nope, it's not working. We've done a tech check yesterday and it was all working fine, but somehow. I think we might have to stop and um, restart the stream if that's okay sorry to our audience we'll be back in a minute yeah, the professor is back so if we can try again yeah. is this any better yes of course okay this is working wonderful <laughs> i don't know what magic has happened but i'm glad it did <laughs> okay well so uh first of all thank you luna for inviting me to participate today uh, and thanks to all of you who are online at the Oxford University Scientific Society. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to hear, be with you, all, all of you. And uh, I apologize for the technical glitches, but uh, that's the world that we live in today. So first and foremost, I hope all of you are, are staying safe and healthy amidst this uh, pandemic. What I want to tell you about today is some of my research on thinking about applications of financial engineering to dealing with cancer, rare diseases, and other afflictions. Now, I have to start with a disclaimer, which is what I usually do for these kinds of talks, and that is that I am not a biomedical expert by any means. My background is in applying mathematical and statistical models to various kinds of financial analyses. And I got interested in healthcare really for personal reasons. A number of years ago, friends and family uh, we're dealing with various types of cancer. And in trying to understand what they were going through, uh, I spent a fair bit of time uh, reading about uh, cancer drug development. And I was amazed by the fact that uh, actually finance plays a very big role uh, in, in this process. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So uh, let me start uh, with um, uh, an observation. And the Observation is that we are currently undergoing uh, a, a, an absolute uh, inflection point 
uh, in how we're dealing with disease. And I'm going to do that with uh, a, a two examples. The first example uh, has to do with uh, Caroline and Cole Carper. Uh, these are two um, patients in a clinical trial focused on a very specific disease known as Leber's congenital amaurosis. It's a rare genetic disorder, a typo in, in one gene, that causes blindness uh, starting from birth, uh, in, interferes with the development of the retina. And so uh, Caroline and, and Cole were born with this particular mutation. But uh, a few years ago, a company called Spark Therapeutics developed a gene therapy, a method of correcting that genetic typo by injecting a virus into the back of the eyes of their patients. And in May of 2016, this particular gene therapy was approved by the FDA. It's called Luxturna. And it actually restores the sight of LCA patients. And so Caroline uh, was quoted uh, by saying, you know, I went out outside when it was snowing and I was like, oh, I can see the snowflakes. It was really cool to actually see something that I've never seen before in my life. And that's really an extraordinary statement. The second example of a gene therapy that has had a similar transformational effect is a company called Agilis uh, Biotherapeutics. This is a company that's based not too far from my office at MIT. And um, it's, it's based on a um, groundbreaking work that was developed by a Taiwanese uh, scientist physician by the name of Dr. Paul Hu. Dr. Hu uh, developed a therapy for treating a very rare condition called L-amino acid decarboxylase deficiency, or AADC deficiency. Now, that's a mouthful, and I certainly had no idea about what it was until I was introduced to this company because they were struggling with financing and so uh, a friend of a friend asked me to, 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 to uh, talk to these folks and give them some advice. It turns out that AADC deficiency is a rare genetic disorder that prevents the body from producing dopamine. That's the so-called uh, uh, feel-good neurotransmitter, uh, apparently responsible for runner's high. Um, I've never experienced that myself. Uh, I, after I run a, a, a few blocks, I get tired out. Uh, and it feels terrible, uh, but my friends tell me that uh, you know when you run long enough, uh, it starts to feel good. Well, that's because of dopamine. It turns out that dopamine plays an important role in the development of motor function as an infant. And, and babies that are born with AADC deficiency, you don't know that there's anything wrong at first because all they do is they lie in their cribs and you think, wow, that's great. I have a I have a starter baby there. They're not making a lot of noise and a lot of fuss. But after a few weeks and then a few months, you realize that something is deeply wrong because the baby is not lifting up its head. It's not moving its arms. It's not rolling over. It's just lying there. And that's not normal uh, after you know, a few weeks and a few months from birth. What I'm going to show you is a video clip of a clinical trial of patient number four, a, a, a child that was diagnosed at two years of age with AADC deficiency. And I'll show you the, the, the clip that uh, provides um, a, a, a video of the child at baseline at two years of age. And then after the treatment, one year later and two years later, you'll see something dramatic. So. Uh, you should all be able to see this now. Uh, let me know if you don't. So this is the baseline. You can see that the child can't lift his head up, cannot lift his arms up, can't roll over, can't move. One year later, same child. This is after the gene therapy, a one-time injection of this virus with the corrected gene into the brain of this uh, two-year-old, now three, and you can see that he's standing. He's not quite able to walk and not able to stand on his own, but he's certainly moving around, much more so than before. And now, two
two years after this one-time injection, he's, he's almost able to walk on his own. We're not sure if he'll ever be able to walk normally because obviously he's learned much later in life uh, how to engage in these motor functions. But it is certainly a, a lot better than what he was doing before this treatment. The blind shall see, the lame shall walk. That phrase comes from a, a, a religious text. But yet, this is happening right now. Biomedical experts are developing therapies that are having tremendous impact on all of us. And this inflection point has been commented on by a number of people, uh, including um, a number of my colleagues that I'll tell you about in a minute. But an illustration of how this is changing the landscape of the drug development industry is given by this table. In the year 2000, if you listed the top 30 best-selling drugs worldwide, this is the list. Now, you may not be able to read it. It's not important. But what I do want you to observe is the highlighting in blue. Out of the top 30 best-selling drugs, the ones that are highlighted in blue are the drugs that have come out of biotech or academic medicine, as opposed to big pharma. And you can see that out of the top 30, in the year 2000, only four have come out of the smaller biotech companies or academia. Well, I want you to take a look at the same table in the year 2018. If you list the top 30 best-selling drugs, the ones that are generating the most revenues for their companies in 2018, this is what the list looks like. Out of the top 30, 24 of them are coming out of biotech or academic medicine. And if you take a look at the top 10, nine out of the top 10 are being produced by the smaller companies. This is the inflection point. It's really changed the entire landscape of the biomedical industry. And my colleagues, uh, Susan Hockfield, Tyler Jacks, and Phil Sharp, they published a report in 2016 that describes this inflection point. They call it convergence. The convergence of the life sciences, physical sciences, and engineering. And the way that, that you science students often refer to this kind of inflection point is the so-called omics revolution. Genomics, the science of being able to sequence the human genome epigenomics, the study of the on-off switches that cause certain genes to be expressed and others to be suppressed. Transcriptomics, the, the study of how these sequences get translated into the various different proteins that make up the human body. Proteomics, the study of the 20 to 25,000 different proteins that are in the human body. Metabolomics, the study of the chemical reactions that occur to make life possible. And most recently, microbiomics, the study of the ecosystem uh, that, uh, in, that, that gives us uh, the ability to engage in these various different uh, you know, uh, human uh, activities. All of these omics have made tremendous breakthroughs over the course of the last even 10 years, never mind you know, 50, except for one. There is one omics that has lagged far behind these others. And that's been a cause for the bottleneck. And what is that? Well, that's economics, <laughs> because we have to figure out ways of paying for all of these things. And that's why I, as an economist, have started getting involved in this area. So let me talk a bit about that, and specifically to refer to what people in the industry call the valley of death. The valley of death is that portion of drug and medical device development between basic science and human trials or phase one. So it's the preclinical area that is really challenged right now in terms of being able to get access to proper funding. And so, you know, when I first learned about the valley of death, my first question was why? 
Why is it the case that it's so hard to get funding for preclinical development when all of these incredible scientific breakthroughs are occurring? And you know, as an economist, I guess it's not surprising that you know, the answer that I came up with is something that I could understand and identify, and that is increasing risk and uncertainty. The fact is that it's becoming harder and harder to develop drugs mainly because we're getting smarter and smarter. Now, I know that that's kind of counterintuitive. Usually, as you get smarter, things are supposed to get less risky and easier. But in the case of drug development, that's not true because all of the various different therapeutics that are being developed are making obsolete the investments that have been created up until now by other companies. And so the fact that you've got all of these new therapeutics means that you're also increasing the chances that your investment that occurred five or 10 years ago are now going to become obsolete thanks to these breakthroughs. So one thing that I can tell you is that investors, they don't like risk and uncertainty. So I want to give you an illustration of this um, by uh, doing a little bit of an of a investment pop quiz. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you four different investments I'm not going to tell you what they are or even over what time period they span. I'm simply going to show you what happens if you invest a dollar in each of these assets over this unspecified multi-year investment horizon. And I'm going to ask you to tell me which of these investments you prefer. You can't mix and match. You can only have one of them. So I want you to imagine investing in your, uh, your, your life savings or, or if you're managing your a portfolio of your parents or your grandparents, what would you do with their money? And you can just put it in the chat, you know, tell me what you would pick, which one is your favorite. We can just see which one's most popular. The green line turns a dollar into $2, not very rewarding, but not particularly risky. The red line turns a dollar into $5, way more rewarding, but, but also quite a bit more volatile. The blue line is the most rewarding of all. It turns a dollar into about seven. Uh, and you can see that it's got a lot more volatility. And the black line is somewhere in between. It's producing a return of about six, six and a half dollars, but not nearly as volatile as the blue line. So if you had to pick one, which one would it be? Green, red, blue, or black? Feel free to put that in the chat, and then we can talk about it a little bit later on. So let me tell you what happens in most cases when I propose this to my students. The vast majority of them pick the black line. And as we see from the, the couple of choices that are in the chat window, that's true with, with you guys as well. Why? Well, the black line seems to have the best trade-off between risk and reward, right? It's not the most rewarding, but it is the most reassuring, as Neba has pointed out. Thank you for that. And so, that's one of the reasons why it is by far the most popular. Okay, let me tell you now what all of you pick, those of you who've made choices. So first of all, the time period goes from 1990 to 2008. That's nearly 20 years of an investment horizon. So that's a pretty long time, right? The green line is U.S. Treasury bills, the safest asset in the world at least for the next few weeks. Let's see what happens with the budget discussions uh, in, in Congress. But assuming that we agree to pay our bills, uh, that is actually a very safe asset. But if you put your money in that green line, you would have earned nothing since 2008, right? Uh, it's very safe, but it's not particularly rewarding. The red line is the US stock market, the S&P 500, the 500 largest stocks in the US market. And if you had put your money in that, which is way more risky and not particularly popular from, from my students' point of view. When I give it to them, very few people pick it. Uh, it turns out that you would have done just fine uh, since 2008. You would have actually done quite well. Now, what about the blue line? The blue line, the most risky of all, is the single pharmaceutical company, Pfizer, one of the largest pharma companies in the world. If you had put your money in Pfizer, well, congratulations you would have done spectacularly well. What about the black line, which is the most popular? Well, the black line is the private investment fund called Fairfield Century. That was the feeder fund to the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme. And had you put your money in that, you would have pretty much lost it all 
uh, in 2008. That's why I had to stop this analysis in 2008. Now, why am I giving this example? Well, it's because it's human nature for all of us to be drawn to that black line. High yielding, low risk assets. That's what we're looking for. And it turns out that in finance, we have a, a metric to capture that tendency. And that metric is called a sharp ratio, named after William Sharp, the Nobel Prize winning economist who developed these ideas in the context of the capital asset pricing model. So Sharp showed that what investors are really looking for are high sharp ratio assets, assets that have high yield per unit risk. And so this sharp ratio is a fraction where the numerator is the average return above and beyond T-bills and the denominator is the risk. And so that ratio gives us a sense of how much return we are earning per unit risk. And it turns out that in the case of, of Pfizer uh, and the S&P 500, the sharp ratio is about close to each other, about 0.43 to 0.54. But the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme before it blew up had a sharp ratio of close to three. And that is an order of magnitude higher than these others. Of course, it was fake. But the fact is that it does give us that kind of temptation that we all want high yielding, low risk assets. The problem with biotechnology is over the course of the last 20 years, its sharp ratio has been going down, meaning that we're actually not able to uh, get the same kind of risk-adjusted return because the complexity of science and medicine have been growing. Now, uh, Jesse points out a very interesting um, uh, idea, which is instead of investing in any one of these things, why not 40% black, 60% blue? Uh, apart from the fact that the black line is not feasible, yes, getting some kind of, of averaging, some kind of, of diversification is generally what we teach in finance. And that's what I want to talk about right now. It turns out that if you look at the investment of a single asset, it may not be that attractive. And I'll give you an example, a second pop quiz that you can give me your opinion on. I want you to consider the investment opportunity where I need $200 million from you up front. And then I need you to be patient and wait 10 years. And at the end of the 10 years, I'll tell you whether or not you get a return. But just to be upfront about it, only in 5% of the times will you get any positive return. 95% of the time, you will lose your entire $200 million. So how many of you would be willing to invest in this? Any takers? Now, when I present this to my students, they, most of them don't answer, just like you're not answering right now. But occasionally, I will get a student who will raise her hand and, and she'll say, uh, Professor Lowe, you know, you didn't tell us. In the 5% chance that uh, it does pay off, what do we get? Most people have the same reaction that, that Ruth just gave, which is, I don't want this because I got a 95% chance of failure. Why would I want to do this and wait 10 years? Now, uh, Neba's on the right track. I'll come to your point in just a minute. It turns out that these are the back of the envelope numbers for, for a typical anti-cancer drug. It takes about $200 million to conduct the clinical trials to see whether or not you've got a good drug. It takes about 10 years to do those trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, and then apply to the FDA for a license. And the probability of success in oncology is less than 5% historically. More than 95% of cancer clinical trials lead to failure. failure. You don't get an approved drug. However, in the unlikely event that you do succeed in developing an anti-cancer drug, it turns out that that will lead to a cash flow of $2 billion a year on average, typically, from years 11 to 20. 
Why is that? Well, because typically the patent life of a drug is about 20 years. The first 10 years are taken up doing clinical trials. And then if you're successful, that means that you get 10 years left on your patent life. So if starting from year 11 through 20, you will get $2 billion a year. And $2 billion a year from 11 to 20 is equivalent to getting a payday of $12.3 billion in year 10, assuming a cost of capital of 10%. And so let me now reframe the question, okay? Now that we've described what you do get in the unlikely event that you succeed. How would you like to invest in an investment project that gives you an expected rate of return of around 12% with the standard deviation of 423.5%. That's got a sharp ratio of 0.02. Now, some of you might be willing to do it, but I suspect that most of you will say, nope, sorry, no thanks, this is way too risky, not interested. Well, this now brings us back to the point that was made earlier by Niba, which is maybe if we do a bunch of them, or somebody else said in the chat window, if you had $4 billion and you could do this a lot, well, maybe then you would invest. Well, that's exactly what I want to get to. Imagine that instead of just investing in one of these things, imagine if we invested in 150 of these things. Now, wait a minute, 150. 150 times 200 million, that's $30 billion. We need $30 billion to invest in 150 of these drug development programs. Where are we going to get uh, $30 billion to get 150 programs? Well, as an economist, I have a very simple answer. The answer is, assume we have $30 billion. Now, now I know that that doesn't sound like a very satisfactory answer, but give me a minute and, and I'll get to that. Suppose we had $30 billion. Well, if we did, if we did, and if these 150 programs were statistically independent, and I'll come back to that too, if they are independently and identically distributed, or IID, then it turns out that the economics completely changes. Instead of having a 423.5% standard deviation, the risk goes down. How far down does it go? It goes down to 35%. So now my sharp ratio is 0.34. 0.34. For one of these, the sharp ratio is 0.02. But for 150 of them, the portfolio's sharp ratio is 0.34. So now let me ask you, how many of you would be willing to invest in this. Not in one of them, but in a portfolio of 150 of them. How many of you would, would be willing to, to give me your money for that? I suspect that a lot more of you would be willing to invest in this. And that's where I'm gonna get my $30 billion. I don't have it, but you do, meaning the crowd. All of you are going to be investing. And if I create an asset management portfolio, most of you would invest in that. Okay. So now, can we really raise the 30 billion? And the answer is it depends. It depends on the risk reward trade off. It depends on these kind of calculations. That's where financial engineering comes in. So we know that scientists and clinicians need the money in order to develop the drugs. That's pretty clear. The question is, where do we get the money? And the answer is, it depends on whether we can structure the right business model to give the portfolio the risk-reward trade-off that investors are looking for. So can we raise the money? Well, in fact, not only can we raise it, but if my assumption is correct that we've got 150 independent trials, each with a 5% probability of success. If that is correct, then not only can I raise the money, I can actually raise it using bonds. 
I can use debt financing. I can borrow money to do this. How much money can I borrow? Well, it depends. What's the probability that I have at least three successes out of 150 independent tries? Well, it turns out that it's a simple binomial distribution. You can calculate that. And the answer turns out to be 98.18%. I've got a 98.18% of creating a portfolio that is going to have three, at least three successful cancer drugs. How much is that portfolio worth? What it's worth is three times $12.3 billion in year 10, or $36.9 billion. And if I have a portfolio that is going to be worth $36.9 billion in year 10, how much debt can I borrow in order to finance that portfolio? Well, it depends. It depends on the face value and the probability of default and the rating and therefore the, the yield, the interest rate that you can charge. It turns out that if you issue up to slightly less than $36.9 billion in face value of bonds at the single A rating, which is what the probability of default is associated with of one minus 98.18%, I can actually generate $31 billion of cash today. In other words, I can actually raise more than I need in order to finance this portfolio given where interest rates are. And you see, this is really the magic. As of now, a single A rated bond issue is at an all time low in terms of the interest rate that's being charged by investors. What this is telling you is that there's tons of money out there. People are desperate to lend money and earn a yield on their cash. And so why don't we just take advantage of it by borrowing? Now, I did have to make an assumption that you got uncorrelated bets. And that assumption, if violated, changes the economics. So as I told you, if I have 150 shots on goal, to use a soccer, soccer or a hockey analogy, then I do have a 98.18% chance of producing at least three successes out of 150 tries. Okay, that's what this graph is showing. But that's assuming that they're independent. What if they're not independent? Suppose that there's a 10% correlation between pairs of projects in my portfolio. At a 10% correlation, the probability of at least three successes goes down to 89%. And what about if it's at 40% correlation, well, then the probability of at least three successes drops to 55%. And if the correlation is 80%, then the chances of at least three successes goes down even further to about 22%. And let me tell you, at 22%, nobody is going to want to buy your debt. You will not be able to finance this portfolio with debt. So the key is managing the correlations. That is the focus that we have to keep our eyes on. When I explained this to one of my pharma colleagues, uh, he, uh, he said, you know what? I've been telling my uh, 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 you know, fellow pharma executives the exact same thing, except um, I don't use this fancy analysis. I describe uh, what happens with my third grade daughter's soccer team. Now, I, my kids never played soccer, so I don't know what he was talking about. So he said, well, if you've ever watched third grade soccer, this is what it looks like. All of the kids are crowding around the ball. And I tell them, no, 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 spread out. Don't go to where the ball is. Go to where the ball will be. And if you compare third grade soccer to World Cup soccer, you understand the notion of diversification. It turns out that pharma companies today are acting more like third grade soccer. Now, this is not a criticism of what they're doing because there are good scientific reasons why you want to cluster. When a scientific breakthrough occurs, like immunotherapy, the ability to use your own body's self-defense mechanisms to deal with cancer. Well, obviously, that's a really important discovery. And based upon other people's experiments, 
that's going to give you ideas for conducting your own experiments to move the field forward. So everybody starts crowding around immunotherapy, anti-PD-1 treatments, and other kinds of cellular therapies. From a scientific point of view, it may make sense. From a financial point of view, it does not. And so we have to balance out the scientific considerations against what an investor is going to want you to do. And that's the point of financial engineering. Diversification can lower the cost of capital. It can lower the hurdle rate that investors are going to demand when they lend you money. And so that's one of the reasons why I started getting involved in this field. I wanted to see whether or not these methodologies that we use all the time to construct a portfolio of mutual funds or hedge funds or retirement portfolios, things that everybody understands in the financial profession, can they be used in the scientific profession? Lots of questions. Do we really need $30 billion? What's the market failure? Why hasn't this already been done? Isn't pharma already doing this? And so on and so forth. And the short answer to all these questions is very simple. I have no idea. I'm just a financial economist. So I'm not even qualified to answer many of these questions. So I've asked other people in the field. I've asked pharma executives what their answer is. And they don't know because their view is that uh, the financial tools that they've been using are the ones that they are familiar with. They've not really applied things like securitization and credit default swaps and, and other derivative securities to dealing with these challenges. I've asked biomedical experts, and their view is they don't know, they're focusing on the medicine. And over the last 10 years that I've been working on these problems, the longer answer that I have is that a number of papers that I've written seem to show that, in fact, these methods are possible. They are, uh, it is possible to apply techniques to improve the amount of funding and the speed with which drugs get developed and brought to market. Uh, and if you want to take a look at these papers, this is a link to my website. Uh, you're welcome to, uh, to take a look at them. But I want to give you just a couple of examples of that research just to make it more concrete. And then I'm going to start wrapping up and I'll leave plenty of time for Q&A. So what I noticed after studying the problem and collaborating with a number of experts in the field that knew a lot more about biomedicine than I do is what I call the fundamental law of healthcare finance. And that's this equation. You know, since I'm from MIT, uh, every PowerPoint presentation that I do has to have at least one equation. And, and this is my one equation. The expected net present value, the, the, the profitability of a given drug development project is given by just three terms. And the three terms are this the present value of profits multiplied by the probability of success minus the costs. That's it. I mean, this is a gross oversimplification. There are many more complex details that need to be considered to calculate the peak sales and the, the, the addressable market and all of these different kinds of estimates. But, but when it all boils down to a bottom line number of the expected NPV, that's how it's constructed. It's with these three components. Now, as an economist, I can tell you that I know a lot about the costs. I know what it costs to run a clinical trial or to engage in preclinical research. I know how much a centrifuge or a mass spectrometer costs. I can tell you a lot about the profits. I know how drugs are priced. I know how they're sold. I can estimate the total addressable market. So I actually can give you a pretty good estimate of that. But as an economist, I can say absolutely nothing about probably the most important thing on this slide, which is the probability of success. The 5% number that I showed you in that previous back of the envelope calculation, that's the number that drives this fundamental law of healthcare finance. And so in answer to the question in the chat, window about how much interest is there to fund research using these methods, it all hinges on this. What's the likelihood that you're going to make money 
and that I, as an investor, am going to make money by backing you, the scientist. So that's when I decided that I better learn how to get this number because I don't have any ability to come up with it. So there are lots of different methods for estimating the clinical trial success rates. That's what we're talking about here. And I wrote a paper uh, a couple of years ago, published in the Journal of Biostatistics, about how to do it using historical data. Uh, and using the largest database that we could find, my students and I estimated probability of success for various different kinds of trials, for cancer, for vaccines recently. Uh, we use machine learning to forecast these probabilities of success. And ultimately, we created an effort at MIT called Project Alpha. Now, I teach at a, at a business school, so I have to come up with snappy acronyms for everything that I do. And so Project Alpha stands for Analytics for Life Sciences Professionals and Healthcare Advocates. That's what Alpha stands for. And there's a website that you can all check out um, where we now, having partnered with a data vendor, one of the largest companies that pro provides data on clinical trial success rates, we use their data to estimate probability of success. And you can all check out this website where we update that on a regular basis. So we calculate the probability of success of phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials across different disease areas. And to uh, uh, Karam's point uh, with precision medicine, if you've got biomarkers, you can actually increase the probability of success. So we actually calculate that as well. We calculate it for rare diseases. Uh, we also look at it over time. So you can see that over time, the probability of success is actually growing as we are getting smarter uh, in dealing with these various different diseases. The risks are growing, but at the same time, the probability of success is also growing. So now that we have these numbers, we can start plugging them in and doing the kind of financial analysis, the economics that we need. Second question that I want to take up is, how much capital do we really need? Do we really need $30 billion? The answer is it depends. It depends on how much does it cost to do a clinical trial, the probability of success, how long it takes, the correlation among the various different shots on goal, and the profits of a particular drug. All of these are inputs into calculating how much do we need. And so my student, Kinwe Sia, and I published a paper recently. Uh, you can uh, uh, download it at this site uh, that shows you how to calculate how much capital you need for a given portfolio and using the uh, parameters and the probabilities that we estimated to Project Alpha, you can actually now do this. And we actually provide you with the source code. So any of you who want to try this out on your own, uh, we've got the, the, the analysis, the simulation source code that you can run on, on your own. But the bottom line is that in order to do this, finance and biomedical experts have to collaborate because Biomedicine has become so complicated that no one person has all of the expertise that he or she needs in order to answer the question of how much capital do we need and how do we actually construct the portfolio. We need to collaborate, and that's why I'm really thrilled to be here today. It's because I want to get you, science students, interested in finance. Not that you should leave your fields. God knows we need your talent in the sciences, but you should understand the financing so that you can actually participate and collaborate with financial experts to get the money that you need in order to be able to develop the therapies that will help us. So I want to give you one concrete example of how much money do we need. Because in cancer, the answer is you do need billions of dollars. But that's cancer. There's another area where you don't need nearly as much money, and that is the area of rare diseases. So what is a rare disease? Well, Examples include hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, ALS, Gaucher's disease, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, and a number of others. According to the 1983 Orphan Drug Act, a, a rare disease is a disease that affects 200,000 patients or less. It turns out that individually, they're rare by definition. But if you take a look at the number of different rare diseases out there, there are about 7,000 of them, at least in the United States, there are about 30 million Americans that suffer from one or another of these diseases. So this is not a small problem by any means. 
Now, it turns out that because of the small patient population, the urgent need, the high prices of these drugs and so on, the economics of rare diseases are very different than for other areas. And as a result, um, you don't need $30 billion to earn a rate of return four to $500 million is enough. And you don't need 150 projects to get diversification. 10 or 20 of them are enough. Why? The answer is because the correlation assumption that I made among various kinds of cancer drugs, it turns out that that doesn't hold true for cancer drugs. If you have five anti-PD-1 therapies and one of them fails, that's not good news for the other four. So there is correlation among those different kinds of therapeutics in cancer immunotherapies. But it turns out that for rare diseases, they are so different that the various different successes and failures of one area have nothing to do with another area in that rare disease space. Lack of correlation among rare diseases makes them unique in a financial perspective. You can create a very attractive portfolio with a relatively small amount of money and a relatively small number of projects if they are rare disease projects. How do I know that? Well, I published a paper in 2015 using data that I obtained from the National Institutes of Health and in particular, the organization focused on rare diseases known as NCATS, National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. I collaborated with a couple of experts, Nora Yang and John McHugh, and we used the NCATS data to calibrate what a portfolio of rare diseases would look like in terms of the cost and the probability of success and so on. And when we ran our simulations, we got a number, a rate of return of about 22%, 22% rate of return on a portfolio of rare disease therapeutics. Now, that's, that's amazing. That's, that's more return than most hedge funds are able to produce. And as a result, new business models are now emerging in that space. And I want to leave you with one example, which is an example that I was personally involved with uh, because it, it involved one of my former students. A number of years ago, uh, I, I taught a class um, on financial analysis for engineering students. And one of the students in the audience was a fellow by the name of Neil Kumar. He was a chemical engineering PhD student, took the class, graduated, went to work um, for a, a consulting company instead of a chemical engineering firm, and then ultimately ended up in biotech. He read my paper and he contacted me and, and asked me whether or not I would be willing to um, rerun some of my simulations using the software that's on Project Alpha, so the same software that I used, you can have access to. And he said, can you rerun it with um, a, a different set of assumptions? Not with your assumptions, but with my assumptions. And so I said to Neil, by all means, I, I, I'd be happy to, because I, I wanted to learn since you know, I didn't have any expertise other than what I drew from NCATS and the industry literature. And so um, he, we ran a number of simulations over the course of four or five months. And at the end of that process, he came to my office and said, I just wanna let you know, I quit my job yesterday. I'm gonna start this company. And I have to say, I was kind of shocked and, and, and really a, a little scared. I've never had that effect on any of my students. And I said to Neil, Neil, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, you sure you don't want me to run a few more simulations? I mean, you've got a good job here. Don't, uh, don't give it up right away. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm very excited to build the company. And so he did. And I, I felt guilty enough uh, and excited enough that I, I invested a small amount of seed capital uh, along with other friends and family. Uh, in retrospect, I wish I had invested a lot more now um, because the company ultimately went on to be a success because of this portfolio approach. So uh, Neil built a portfolio uh, in a company called Bridge Biopharma. And uh, it was started around 2000 and, and actually 14 and 15 when we started talking about this because he had seen a, a preprint of my paper. And uh, very quickly, it got funding because people understood that the portfolio concept would reduce the risk. And um, we came out of stealth mode in 2017. 
Uh, the company raised additional capital in uh, uh, shortly thereafter in 2018. Um, and in uh, 2019, the company did an IPO, the, the largest at the time in the biotech industry. Uh, and uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, the company raised yet another round of financing. So it is now very well capitalized. And um, as of uh, yesterday, the company was trading at a market cap of about eight and a half billion dollars. Five years, eight and a half billion dollar market cap. Now, that's not what this company is most proud of. If you talk to the people at Bridge Bio, including Neil, without exception, they'll tell you what they're most proud of is this. After five years, they now have 21 assets in their portfolio, all rare disease drugs, many of which would have never been developed without Bridge Bio. And out of these 21, four, four of these drugs are in phase three clinical trials. And we expect one approval by the end of this year and another one next year. That's incredibly fast over a very, very short period of time. So um, let me uh, conclude by pointing out that this is just the beginning. I'm expecting and hoping that 2021 will be a year where even more capital comes into the industry and that maybe bio bonds, the idea of issuing bonds collateralized by biomedical assets, that will be a reality in 21. It doesn't exist yet, but I'm hopeful that we will see something like it. So uh, I'm going to conclude by um, you know, saying that, that for all of these ideas are really interesting from an academic perspective, but it's taken on a very personal dimension for me, particularly after I heard the story of one of my MIT colleagues uh, by the name of Harvey Lodish. Uh, he's a professor of biology at the MIT Whitehead Institute. And when I heard Harvey's story, I decided then and there that, that I want to be Harvey Lodish. And when I tell you his story, you'll want to be Harvey Lodish too. In 1983, Harvey was approached by a venture capitalist asking whether or not he would be willing to collaborate with him on developing a drug for the rare disease of Gaucher's. Gaucher's is, again, a single genetic mutation that prevents your body from producing an important housekeeping enzyme. And without that enzyme, fatty acids build up in your organs. And by the time you uh, become a teenager, you are incapacitated and, and many of Gaucher patients die at that point. And so Harvey had some expertise in cellular biology that would be particularly useful for developing a therapy for Gaucher's. And so he and a number of his colleagues agreed to work with this biotech VC. And in 1991, they developed a therapy called Seridase, which was the very first enzyme replacement therapy. They would actually provide patients that had this genetic mutation with the much needed enzyme. And with that enzyme, they could lead a perfectly normal and healthy life. And that therapy, along with many of its improvements, have saved the lives of tens of thousands of patients uh, since then. And uh, you may have heard of Harvey's little company. Uh, it's called Genzyme. And uh, Genzyme was acquired uh, in 2014 for something like $20 billion by the French pharmaceutical company Sanofi. Now, that's a great story, but that's not why I want to be Harvey Lodish, although it's not a bad reason. I want to be Harvey because of what happened in the year 2002. You see, in that year, Harvey's daughter was pregnant with her second child, Harvey and his wife's second grandchild, a boy uh, who they named uh, Andrew. Great name, by the way. Andrew was diagnosed in utero with Gaucher's disease. What are the chances of that? So I, I asked Harvey about that. It was a it was a very emotional conversation. I asked him, Harvey, in 1983, when you were doing this work, did you have any idea that you had the mutation for Gaucher's and that, and that the drug that you are helping to develop back then would one day save the life of your as yet unborn grandchild? And you know, he said, oh, of course not, I had no idea. I, the human genome wasn't sequenced until 2003. So we didn't have methods for easily sequencing our own genome. So we had no idea we had the mutation. And, and 
So you can imagine that Harvey is a pretty popular member of that household because in 2012, when Andrew turned 10, he started developing the symptoms of Gaucher's, but he's going to live a completely normal and healthy life thanks to the drug that grandpa helped develop. This is why I want to be Harvey Lodish. But I can't be Harvey Lodish because I don't have a PhD in cell biology or an MD. But I realized something. I realized that all of us, we can all be Harvey Lodish if we invest in the drugs that will save our as yet unborn grandchildren. Finance doesn't have to be a zero sum game if we don't let it. We can actually do well by doing good if we are able to use the right kinds of financing. Sorry, I, I teach finance students, so I have to have some sound effects uh, and keep them interested. Anyway, I'm going to stop here, and I want to thank you all for being with me today. The reason that I was so keen to speak to all of you is because you are the future of the biomedical industry. And if anybody is going to develop the therapies that will save our future generation of kids, uh, it's going to be all of you. So thank you for being with me today, and I'm happy to stay uh, and answer questions and comments um, as, uh, as appropriate. Thank you so very much for your talk. As you, I remember in your course, you said, we're all stakeholders in this business. And in the end, what we do will benefit ourselves. So I guess um, now we'll turn to you on say some questions. Uh, Editor Lorenzo, may we have the first question on caption, please? Okay, it's from Karim. Why are we applying this kind of financial engineering model beyond biomedical breakthroughs to solve things like climate change and other challenges that we might face in the sciences? Well, the short answer is that I hope we are and will apply them. Uh, so I'm actually working on that right now, um, in particular with respect to climate change and uh, renewable energy. It turns out that these very same methods can apply. Uh, in particular, uh, one project that I'm working on now is with the MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center to see whether or not we can actually use these methods to finance uh, R&D for fusion energy. The ability to create fusion reaction is something that we've known about for literally decades. Uh, but someone once said that fusion energy is the, is the energy source of the future, and it always will be. <laughs> And, and it's partly because we have not made enough progress in thinking about the intellectual property that can be commercialized along the way. So if we think about fusion reaction, not as a single technology, but rather a portfolio of technologies, including things like superconducting magnets and so on, it turns out that that might create a different funding model. And so that was part of the basis for MIT's participation in this private sector venture called Commonwealth Fusion which is a, a, a private entity. It's funded by investors, but in collaboration with the MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center. This can be applied to many other areas. And in a paper that I wrote um, titled Funding Long Shots, you can find that on my website, uh, that shows you how to take this technology and apply it to lots of other areas, including climate change, uh, dealing with poverty, some of society's biggest challenges. It doesn't always work. You have to run the numbers, and in some cases, it can't work because the rate of return is simply not big enough. But that's where government needs to play a role, and public-private partnerships can then make it work quite well. Following on from that question, following on from that question um, how much does or can the government contribute to such projects, and should they? So uh, following what I just mentioned, absolutely, the government plays a huge role, and definitely they should. How? The answer has to do with the Sharpe ratio. If you've got a Sharpe ratio that's very high, you don't need government because money will come in, as all of us did with that black line, right? But what if the Sharpe ratio is very low, even though the returns to society are very high? Let me give you an example. Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's affects a tremendous number of patients around the world, 5 million just in the United States alone. And Alzheimer's is a very, very profitable uh, market if you can get a drug approved. But in order to do that, you need multiple shots on goal. How many shots do we have in Alzheimer's? Well, as of now, as far as I know, 
there are basically two scientific theses for dealing with Alzheimer's, amyloid uh, and uh, the tau protein. That's it. And so when you look at the investment in Alzheimer's therapeutics, it's way, way, way more risky because we don't understand enough about the basic biology of the disease. So one role that government can play and the role that it did play in cancer back in the 1960s and 70s is to fund basic scientific research where the sharp ratio is zero. You, you don't get a rate of return on basic science. What you get are returns after the science has progressed to the point where you can identify a target and then be able to develop a drug to focus on hitting that target. So government plays a critical role in funding the early stages of scientific investigation that will eventually lead to the lower hanging fruit that we are now enjoying. Let's hope that we'll find more low, lower hanging fruits in Alzheimer's. In fact, something that I'm very passionate about. But I know we have many more questions, so may we have the next one, please? How do we motivate the pharmaceutical industry to develop drugs that prevent illness instead of ones that treat symptoms or chronic illnesses? Well, that's a great question, and I really like the way you pose it, because you're absolutely right. We need to motivate, we need to incentivize big pharma. And that is done to some degree, but it's not done to nearly the degree that it could be. For example, Me Too drugs. It turns out that pharma right now has an incentive to focus on Me Too drugs because it's less risky. Well, one way to change that incentive is perhaps to provide a higher hurdle for getting FDA approval for a second indication if you already have a good drug, or rather to provide more of an incentive for pharma companies to provide a first-in-class therapeutic. So one way to do it, in the case of Alzheimer's, right now we, don't, we have not had an approved drug in Alzheimer's since 2003. Yes, the last drug, you heard me, the last drug that was approved by the FDA for Alzheimer's was in 2003. That's 18 years ago. Last year we had like 25 new cancer drugs approved, 25 new drugs in one year, zero for Alzheimer's in 18 years. So how do we incentivize pharma? What if we say that for the, for the next three drugs in Alzheimer's, the, the next three that are approved, instead of getting a 20-year patent life, they get a 30-year patent life. You give 10 extra years of exclusivity. And then after that, it becomes generic and free for all. That's an example of providing motivation. So there are many other examples like that. And uh, feel free to take a look at my website. I've written a number of, uh, of papers that describe how we can use finance and economics to incentivize not only the industry, but scientists, clinicians, and investors to be able to develop more therapies for patients. Following around from that, um, if we grant a longer patent for these kind of first-in-class drugs, does that mean that in the end, the patients will end up paying for these? Well. Somebody is going to end up paying for them. Absolutely. That's true. That's right. <laughs> yes. Who? Well, partly it'll be the patients, but more likely it will be all of us. So in the UK, where many of you are right now, it's the National Health Service. Mm -hmm. So the UK has a single payer system. And as a result, if there is a new therapy that everybody has access to, then effectively everybody will pay. And so this gets at a very, very important question, which is, is that fair? Is that, is that the right thing to do? In the United States, it's a lot more complicated because we do not have a single health payer, uh, single uh, payer system. And so there are a number of patients that may not be able to get access to a therapy simply because they have a bad health plan. So there are ethical dimensions that are raised by it. But my view is that ultimately, if we create these amazing therapies, then yes, all of us should be willing to pay for it. And if we do it in a responsible way where we are able to control the risk and manage the ultimate uh, uh, amount of volatility that investors are getting exposed to, there is enough money in the system for all of us to be able to get access to these therapeutics. Mm -hmm. I suppose if it really were my relatives or your relatives or any of our audience relatives, we will be more than willing to go ahead and pay whatever price it takes. Maybe we have the next question, please. 
Oh, this is a quite a long one. What are the pros and cons from raising funds from the public markets instead of the private sources? Yeah, that's also a really uh, interesting and, and, and um, uh, topical question. Um, it's a rather sophisticated one because what it shows is that you understand the distinction between private investments and going public. It turns out that over the course of the last 10 years, fewer and fewer companies have been going public. They've been getting access to private capital. And I think that that, in general, tends to be more attractive from the entrepreneur's perspective, simply because private capital has fewer regulations. Uh, so there are benefits if you can get access to it. The benefit for going public, though, for doing an IPO, is mainly twofold. One, you can actually allow the venture capitalists and other private investors to get liquidity. In other words, they can divest of their investments and earn a rate of return on their capital. That's the first benefit. But the second benefit is that you now have access to a much wider pool of capital. Instead of just a few very, very big private investors, you now are being able to get money from ordinary people like you and me. And so that gives you an opportunity to raise much larger amounts of money, uh, and in, in some cases, much more quickly. Uh, but the, the, the trade-off that you're getting at implicitly in your question is that once you become a public company, you are going to be under a microscope all the time uh, in terms of your performance. So at the end of every single day, I can observe exactly what the market thinks of me as an entrepreneur. Bridge Bio, they did well yesterday. Uh, but the day before they were down and, you know, a few weeks ago they were down by a lot. And then a few weeks before that they were up by a lot. So it is a, a financial roller coaster ride that can also be an emotional coaster ride, a roller coaster ride if you're, uh, you know, the entrepreneur. I suppose in this case, you have to say the market judges all. May you have the next question, please. As artificial intelligence becomes more sophisticated, how do you think that it could be used in biomedical research in the future? Oh, in fact, it is not only it not only can be used; it is already, it's already being used. <laughs> there, there are a number of companies, uh, including uh, companies like Helix, which is a UK-based company using AI for drug discovery. Uh, Atomwise in the UK, Schrodinger, Nimbus, uh, 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 in Citro. Uh, there are lots of companies out there that are using tools like machine learning. Uh, and data science to be able to forecast drugs. And you know, I'm doing it as well in terms of forecasting clinical trial outcomes with my students. So we believe that AI is just the tip of the iceberg in completely transforming biomedicine, never mind telemedicine, never mind being able to use these methods to actually help patients directly in diagnosing diseases. There are all sorts of applications. So I encourage those of you who are in the field of AI think about medicine as a potential avenue of applying your trade because it, there are, are a, an amazing number of opportunities for you to be able to help patient lives by using these technologies. If I'm allowed to ask anything, um, um, you can do you a, can lot, do a lot, lot good by helping help 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 So please come along for the ride. It will be a fun one. May we have the next question, please? Yes, here we go. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so we'll probably have one or two more questions. Big Pharma are already diversified across therapeutic areas and targets. They can issue bonds at low rates. What's the difference um, other than that BridgeBio is a more efficient organization versus pharma? Yeah, really good point. So it turns out that there are some important differences, but you're absolutely right. First of all, Big Pharma is a portfolio. If you take a look at Pfizer, they have, I don't know, 50 different drugs, uh, and probably another you know, 75 or 100 in the pipeline. So when you look at Pfizer, they are a mega fund of sorts. What's the difference? Well, what the difference is, is that big pharma is highly centralized. And as a centralized organization, they don't have the flexibility to be able to choose lots of different programs at various different times and you know, completely destroy one area in order to fund another. They're, they're less flexible, they're less nimble. Whereas uh, an organization like Bridge Bio that is, is a holding company structure, parent company at the top, subsidiaries at the bottom, they're much more flexible and allow each individual company to pursue its own path independently. That's one difference. The second difference 
is that big pharma is actually focused on a very different business. And I was trying to get at that with my table of top 30 best-selling drugs. So it turns out that big pharma is actually involved in two different kinds of businesses. One business is in developing drugs. That's what we've been talking about. But there's a second business. The second business is marketing, licensing, and distributing drugs. And it turns out that that second business is a lot more profitable on a risk-adjusted basis. It has a lot higher sharp ratio than developing drugs. Developing drugs is really hard. And the sharp ratio, as I've described, is pretty low. But late stage drug development and then drug sales, that is very profitable, very high sharp ratio. So over the past decade, Big Pharma has actually been getting out of R&D and getting into M&A because it actually is more profitable for its in investors. And I'm not criticizing Big Pharma. That's what they should be doing because that's what they're good at. And so Big Pharma, instead of doing early stage translational medical research, what they will do is wait. They will look at the biotech companies that are out there. And when they find a biotech company that's doing something really good and that has de-risked an asset from preclinical to phase two, they will buy that company in some cases for billions of dollars because then they can take it from phase three all the way to approval. And then they know how to market, license, and distribute it across lots of different markets. So the ecosystem is changing where big pharma is focusing less and less on the valley of death. And that's actually created a bigger problem for the valley of death, which is why you need bridge bio and other models like it in order to fill the gap and, and why it's happening now and why more and more scientists are being attracted to this field because of those opportunities. I think you're also sure that, that, that governments like are like, very important role in bridging this um, value of death and helping um, these very early stage biotech companies to overcome the barrier and be able to be acquired by a pharma company. Uh, may we have one last question, please? I'm very aware that we are almost approaching the end. Wow, this is a very long one. Okay, all right, I'll try to read that. How has this pandemic with operational warp speed and the new administration's vaccination rollout changed or accelerated us into the future of pharmaceutical development and approval? And I will ignore the last part because that's already a really long question. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for that question. That's a great one to close on. Um, so I've written a paper on my website about a, vaccine, a global vaccines mega fund. And that analysis actually had a pretty, pretty dark conclusion prior to the pandemic. The conclusion is that a vaccines portfolio is not feasible. It's not gonna earn a good rate of return. Why? Because the main customers of vaccines in the past has been governments and will be in the future as well. Governments are the ones that are paying for vaccines because vaccines involve infectious diseases, which is a public health issue, and therefore the government has to be involved. Vaccines is not a very attractive business. However, it turns out that with the pandemic, with COVID-19, all of that has changed. Because in the past 12 months, we as a world have realized just how devastating a global pandemic can be. And so going forward, I believe that vaccines will be a tremendously exciting and profitable business, but largely because governments have now gotten the message that they need to pay for these things the way that will make it feasible for private sector companies to earn a good rate of return. And that coupled with the enormous, enormous progress that has been made in the development of vaccines using mRNA technology by companies like Moderna and BioNTech and others, we've now seen the power of this biomedical inflection point in completely changing the landscape for how we deal with these infectious diseases. So I believe that starting now, because of the pandemic, because of the massive loss of life that we've experienced, that tragedy is now gonna launch us into a golden age of dealing with infectious diseases, both vaccines and antibiotics. So going forward, this is gonna be a very exciting area, both in the scientific perspective and from the financial perspective. And so I wanna leave you with all of, 
all of you with the encouragement. Please stay safe and healthy for the next few months. It'll be just a few more months before you're all vaccinated. Until then, uh, please wear your masks. Please stay away from crowds and uh, stay safe and healthy because you are the future of the industry. You are the future of biomedicine and we can't afford to lose any more. Thank you Thank so you much for that yeah. sobering message. I guess, I guess that's all the time we have for questions. Um, uh, I sure hope all of you are as mind blown by Professor Lowe's talk as I was when I first encountered his online course. Thank you to our audience. We would not be here without your attention. Thank you to our committee members. Special mentions this week goes to our new webmaster, Millie, as well as our editor, Lorenzo, who made broadcasting talks possible, but had to stay behind the scenes every single time. A final thank you, of course, goes to our honorable speaker today, Professor Andrew Lowe, for taking time out from your very busy schedule to give a talk with five hours of time difference in between. Next week's event will be on Tuesday at 6.30 p.m., featuring Professor Aspiro Kuzek from University of Toronto. And the title will be, We Have No Time for Science As Usual. Enjoy the rest of your day, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you very much.